Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. Okay, good to see everybody in again this afternoon, and for those of you joining us on television, we'd just like to welcome you to a simple, plain Bible study. We don't try to uh, preach at you, we don't try to condemn other people, we won't attack anyone, but hopefully we can just open the Scriptures, and uh, as we find in our travels, uh, that's exactly what the Lord is doing. We're finding that more and more people are understanding what they read and are enjoying what they read, and consequently, they're sharing it with others. Uh, in fact, uh, we just had a phone call this morning, and uh, it was on our answering machine, and I imagine the gentleman will catch it someday. But uh, he wanted to know what we could accomplish with nothing but gray-headed people in our audience. <laughs> and it kind of upset my little wife, and she said, what he doesn't realize is that it doesn't matter how the color of your hair, we are a people who share what we've learned. And I think that's what we're finding. All across the country, we're finding that people are willingly sharing, and uh, sometimes their local churches almost kick them out, but uh, that's to be expected when you step on their toes with truth. But nevertheless, for those of you out in television, we appreciate the fact when you write and tell us that you're uh, not only learning yourselves, but you're sharing it with others. And uh, we know the Lord's going to bless that. So uh, always remember, we're just a verse-by-verse -verse Bible teaching. We started years ago back in Genesis. And so for some of you who are new to the program, this is why we repeat and review from time to time, because we have covered so much that some of you who have just tuned in in the last six, uh, last six months or a year have totally missed. So uh, bear with me when we uh, review and repeat. Okay, now we're in 2 Peter, and uh, ready to start with verse 1. And I want again to emphasize that except for Paul's epistles, all of Scripture is on a straight timeline, one thing just unfolding, everything looking forward to the day when Christ would set up his kingdom here on earth. And they have as yet no idea that God is going to set that out into the future for 2,000 years. And so all these writers of the Jewish economy, the kingdom gospel, are looking at all this to come in their lifetime. And unknown to them, of course, God has set aside the Apostle Paul with the revelation of the mystery. So we're going to go back for just a second to James, so that you get what I'm driving at, that all of these writers, James and Peter and John and Jude and even the writer of the Revelation, are still writing on the same basis of the Old Testament prophecies, Christ's earthly ministry, Peter and the Eleven in the book of Acts, and now they're looking for the horrors of the tribulation that they feel are right out in front of them, which, of course, will be fulfilled to a certain degree with the 70 A.D. invasion of Titus. But that wasn't the tribulation that is still future. All right, so just to give you an inkling what I'm talking about, James again, chapter 1, verse 1, and take note, to whom is he writing? Well, he is writing to the 12 tribes who are where? Scattered. And again, you have to remember that because of Saul of Tarsus' tremendous persecution, what had happened to that Jerusalem congregation? They scattered for fear of their lives, and they took up residence in other parts of that part of the world, the Roman Empire. All right, now you turn on over then to 1 Peter, where we were a couple, three tapings ago, and the language is almost the same. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, where now Peter writes as an apostle of Jesus Christ, writing to, who? The strangers, not to the citizens of Rome and Athens, but to the strangers who were scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, so on and so forth. Those are Jews who had been scared away from Jerusalem because of the awful persecution. All right, now then when you come into 2 Peter, the language doesn't change all that much. 2 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them who have obtained like precious faith with us. Now, goodness sakes, when and where did Peter attain his faith that Jesus was the promised Messiah? Well, way back there at Galilee. 
when he was at his fishing nets and the Lord walked by and said, follow me. Well, that's where Peter's faith began, Christ's earthly ministry. In the same way here, he's writing to those people who had been connected with Christ's earthly ministry. They as yet know nothing of Paul's gospel of grace. They are still under what we call the kingdom economy. And you can just follow this on through. Go into John. Uh, I just thought of this on the way up. See, I've said it before. Iris probably wonders why I'm quiet as a mouse all the way up here. Well, this is what I have to mull over. How can I review this and make the point that these little epistles are still connected to the Jews of Christ's earthly ministry? All right, so even 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the Word. And what's he referring to? Christ's earthly ministry. See? When they actually saw him, and they were with him, and, and they, you might say, handled him, and so forth. All an extension now of Christ's earthly ministry. Well, you can come right on in to uh, Second and Third John, say basically the same thing, but now look at Jude. Just so I make my point, because otherwise people think I'm coming in out of the woodwork. I'm, I'm off the wall. No, I want you to see how all of this ties straight back to Christ's earthly ministry and His gospel of the kingdom to the Jew only. All right, now look what Jude says. Verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and the brother of whom? James. Well, who was James? Well, he was part and parcel of Israel, see? And so he's tying himself to the twelve. Well, we certainly know that Revelation is all Jewish. You know, I was reading a commentary just the other night, written in 1890. And it just thrilled my heart. Well, that old fellow said the same thing I've been screaming for the last 20 years. All of these things are Jewish. See? These are all Jewish epistles. The book of Revelation is all Jewish. There's nothing of Gentiles except as they come under being uh, associated with Israel. But the books and these little epistles are all written to the Jewish People. All right, now I think I've still got my timeline on from my last program or our last taping, and uh, I'm going to review it again for the sake of our newer listeners, that according to the Old Testament promises coming out of the Old Testament to Christ's earthly ministry, His rejection, His resurrection, His ascension back to glory, then Peter starts proclaiming in Acts chapter 2 that the one they crucified was the Christ and if they would repent of having rejected their Messiah, then in chapter 3, verse 20, what does he say? God will send Jesus Christ. Why? To yet fulfill the promises. And so everything stays on that top timeline. And so here we come through the book of Acts, and they're looking at these seven years. Now we've jumped over, of course, in our study from from Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8, over to the little epistles now. But see, they're in this period looking at this seven years ahead of them. And they have no idea that it's going to be pushed out into the future. Now, the Lord did. He was God. He's the author of the book. He knew that this was all going to be postponed. But Peter didn't. In Acts chapter 2, Peter quotes Joel, and he takes you right on through the tribulation to the second coming in the kingdom with no idea that it's going to be interrupted. And so always remember these things, that in between, in between, of course, we have now had 1900 and some years of this age of grace, which came about through the revelations of the mysteries that were revealed to the Apostle Paul. And that, of course, is why I emphasize Paul for us today. He is the Apostle of the Gentiles. All the rest of Scripture was written to the nation of Israel. And so keep all these things in mind now as we'll move on into 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. He's still writing to the same people he wrote to in his first letter, but he's writing probably about 10 years later. 1 Peter, I think, as we put on the board here several times ago, was probably written in the 60s, maybe the late 60s, 67, 68, whereas 2 Peter is written just shortly before he'll be martyred. He already makes mention of it down here in verse 14, that he will shortly be facing his demise. 
And I have said it over and over that I feel that Peter and Paul were both martyred probably within a matter of days or weeks because both of them speak now as the end of their earthly, earthly sojourn. Peter says it down here. Well, I guess I might as well cover my tracks with Scripture. Come down to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Chapter 1, verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Now the tabernacle is a re reference to the body, this temporary tent. All right, and I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Well, you remember the Lord referred to that in the last verses of John's Gospel. Now, I said that Paul was no doubt martyred at about the same time. So back up, if you will, honey, to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 1. Sorry, 2 Timothy, chapter 4. 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 6. Almost identical language with Peter, and I think, like I've said over and over, almost the identical time frame. Whilst Paul is being readied for his martyrdom in Rome, I think Peter is being readied for his martyrdom wherever he was. I think Jerusalem, I may be wrong, but... Uh, he says Babylon, but I think the Babylon of that is Jerusalem, as it is referred to in a couple other places. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, this is Paul's statement, that is, end is in sight. Verse 6, he said, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is what? At hand. And he's speaking of his physical death, see? And so, both of these gentlemen now, both Paul and Peter, come to the end of their ministry in the latter part of the 60s, and then, as I've pointed out again so often, that shortly after Paul and Peter are gone, in comes the Roman invasion under Titus in 70 AD, and Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed, and the Jews are then scattered into the dispersion that has lasted up until our own time. All right, but now let's come back to chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, or Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them who have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, now let's come back and compare Scripture with Scripture. It's the only way we can learn anything. Here, Peter is claiming to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by inspiration. Now let's back up to Galatians chapter 2, where from the pen of the apostle Paul, we see it defined a little finer. Galatians chapter 2, dropping in at verse 7 and 8. And I know when people hear and see me delineate these verses, it shakes them up. They really don't want to believe it. And yet they can't argue with the Scripture because there's no gobbledygook language here. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this. It's plain English. All right, Galatians chapter 2, dropping in at verse 7. Where Paul now writes, contrarywise, or on the other hand, when they, the twelve, with whom he had come to settle these arguments, but when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, the gospel of the Gentile, was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision, the gospel of the Jew, or the gospel of the kingdom, was committed unto Peter. Now that's plain language. You have two total different economies. The gospel of the uncircumcision, the Gentile world, was committed unto Paul. The gospel of the Jew was committed unto Peter. All right, but now look at the next verse. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of whom? The Jews, the circumcision. See how plain that is? Peter was an apostle of the circumcision. And then read on. The same God was mighty in me, by declaring the Apostle Paul, of course, an apostle of Gentile. Now let's back that up with Scripture. 
Keep in Galatians, I'm not through here. Come back with me to Romans, chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. Because unless you see these things in black and white, it, it may be a little hard to swallow. But here it is, just as plain as language can make it. Romans 11, verse 13. Gotta wait till you all find it. Because again, I'm constantly reminded by our TV audience, they, they want to keep up with us. All right, Romans 11, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentile. See how plain that is? He wasn't an apostle of Israel. He was an apostle of the Gentile. Peter and the eleven were apostles of Israel. Two totally different apostleships. Same God. That's why I was going to make the point here when we get back to 2 Peter. Even though these things are written primarily Jewish believers, that doesn't mean that we ignore it. That doesn't mean to take it out of your Bible and throw it away. It's applicable. We can learn because we're dealing with the same God. And God doesn't differentiate in His righteousness and His uh, reaction with you and I as Gentiles and the Jew. In that respect, He's the same. But on the other hand, by the responsibilities, the directions He gives them for fulfilling their dispensation, yes, it's different. It's different. All right, so now back to Galatians chapter 2 for a moment, and then we'll go back to Peter. Galatians chapter 2. Reading verse 8 again, He that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the Jew, the same Christ, the same God, was mighty in me as an apostle of the Gentiles. Now verse 9, Now when James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, that is, of that Jerusalem church, perceived or understood the grace that was given unto me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we, Paul and Barnabas, should go to the heathen, the Gentiles, and they, James, Peter, and John, and the rest of the twelve, should go where? To the circumcision, to Israel. Okay, now then, let's go back. Maybe I can stay in Peter for a little bit here. In chapter 2 Peter, chapter 1, now verse 2. And so when we've established that indeed Peter is an apostle of Israel, as Paul is the apostle to Gentile, but it's the same God. And so we can certainly glean things in here that are for our benefit. All right, verse 2. <clears throat> Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord, or of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3. According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, does that sound much different than Paul? No. Let me show you. Back up a few pages again, honey. Back to Titus. Back to Titus because, oh, listen, I want people to see that this book fits hand in glove. Even though you may have Peter addressing Jews and Paul addressing Gentiles, but God's the same. All right, you got Titus, chapter 2. Now, this is Paul writing to you and I. Almost the same thing that Peter wrote to his Jewish believers. Titus chapter 2, drop in at verse 11. For the grace of God, see, just like Peter said, that grace and knowledge. Paul says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has, past tense, appeared unto all men. Now here it comes. Teaching us. This is what we're supposed to know. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts or pleasures, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Does that sound much different than Peter? No. Practically the same language, see? And so for the believer of any dispensation, these are the things that God is looking for. All right, back to Second Peter. Reading on the last part of the verse 3. And given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. See, the same word is in Titus. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Being good. 
All right, now verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, wait a minute. Just stop and think. Just stop and think what they've uncovered the last few weeks in Iraq. What did they tell you? Corruption. Corruption. Those palaces showed more human corruption and immorality than people could even imagine. But you know what? It isn't limited to Baghdad. It's not limited to Iraq. That's the world in general. Right here in our own beloved nation, my, whenever I read of the political corruption, then I have to be amazed that we have survived as a republic as long as we have. The corruption is just beyond human understanding. Not just sexual, it can be financial, it can be in every category of society. Corruption abounds, see? Well, we're not to have a part and parcel of that. We're to be above the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, that reminds me of another thing. What did Paul say was the number one commandment? Thou shalt not covet. Well, what's the difference between coveting and lusting? Almost nothing. And so what prompts, what prompts all this corruption? What prompts an embezzler? What prompts the person who starts getting crooked? Coveting, see? Coveting. I don't care whether it's Enron or World.com or whatever, it's all the same thing, see? All right, back to chapter 1, verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence and to your faith virtue. What is always paramount? Faith. Without faith, you cannot please God. Everything in our relationship with God has to start on that bedrock word, faith. Without faith, you don't stand a snowball's chance. But with faith, then everything begins to fall in place, see? All right, and so by faith, as we feed on the word of God, it's going to bring us to a place of virtue, all right? And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge... Temperance. See how everything just builds on that which went before? And to temperance, patience. To patience, we can add godliness. Now remember, that's a small g. That doesn't mean we become gods. It merely means we pertain to a life that is after God's design. Verse 7, we then can add to godliness, brotherly kindness or love. And to brotherly kindness, indeed, charity, which is love. Now verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound. Now remember, don't forget. i got to remind you. Who is Peter writing to? Believers. Believers. In the midst of even the Jewish community of unbelief. Even a lot of the fellow Jews who were neighbors and friends of these believers hated them, persecuted them, made life miserable for them. And we're in the same circumstances. That, that part isn't any different. But see, this is who Peter is writing to. He's writing to believing Jews who are being persecuted by their own fellow unbelieving Jews as well as the pagan Romans. And in between that vice, not sinful vice, the squeezing vice, the shop vice, in between that vice are these believers being constantly squeezed, see? And so Peter is admonishing them not to give in to these pressures. All right, verse 8 again, For if these things be in you and abound, in other words, there's enough of it so it makes an impact on the people around you, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's another word that Paul is always using. Let's back up to that, and we got time enough. Come back with me to uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. 
And then if you got time to go on ahead while we're still looking, you can go to Colossians chapter 1, where he mentions the same thing again. Which means it's important that we have knowledge. All right, look at Ephesians 1, chapter 3. Jumping in at verse 17. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. All there? Now this is Paul's prayer on behalf of Gentile believers. And he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts, how? By faith. And that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints, not just a few of the elite, but he wants all believers to comprehend what is the breadth and length and depth and height, which is four dimensions, and we live in a world of three. Now verse 19, and to know the love of Christ which passeth, what? Knowledge. And that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, which includes knowledge. All right, now come over to Colossians chapter 1, and he makes it a little plainer probably than in Ephesians. Colossians chapter 1, again it's the Apostles' Prayer on behalf of you and I as believers. Verse 10, 10 and 11. Colossians 1, jump in at verse 10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. In other words, God doesn't expect us to be a bunch of kooks that the world can just ridicule because we're oddballs. No, we are to be so rooted in our Christian faith that even though the world may not love us, they'll have to respect us for what we are. They have to look at us and have to admit that they wish they could be as we are. All right, so Paul is praying that we might just be good, solid testimonies of God's grace, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all, even the unsaved world, pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. And here it is, increasing day by day, increasing in what? The knowledge of God. We're not just saved to sit. We are saved to serve, and we're going to serve by increasing in our knowledge. And how do you increase in knowledge? Prayer and Bible study. And oh, it's so lacking. It's so lacking. But get into the book and learn and pray and grow. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.